told them Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Professor Blesik, for the nice and short introduction. <laughs> so, uh, this is the second conference I give on René Girard's talk. And the first conference was a presentation of, a general presentation, actually, of his talk. And today what I want to do is, I want to tell you the story a little bit <laughs> of how I applied Girard's theory into domains where he had not been actually active. So I will tell the story a little bit like I lived it, so to speak, how the problem arose for me and how I tried to resolve it. So, <coughs> the problem was this. The most, actually, one of the most, probably the most controversial part of René Girard's theory concerns his interpretation of Christianity. And in this interpretation of Christianity, he says, well, actually, the traditional sacred was a means of protection against violence. Christianity reveals the mechanism which allowed this to function, and by doing this, makes these traditional means of protection against internal violence inefficient. They don't work anymore. So as a consequence of this, well, we, in Girard's, present this in a very apocalyptic way, saying, as a consequence of this, we are now faced with a very stark choice. Either we destroy ourselves completely because we've lost means of protection against our own violence, or, more or less, the kingdom of God. Now, fine. The problem is this. The problem is that we have been in this situation for 2,000 years, right? So there must be something. So if we agree overall to the explanation, without necessarily buying everything, but agree overall to the interpretation of Girard, then we're left with a problem. And this problem is, what protects us against violence? Right? If the traditional mechanisms do not work anymore, and since clearly we have not renounced of, to violence in an absolute way, and, decided to become all saints though. This is, so we are neither on one side of the alternative nor on the other side of the alternative. So what protects us against violence? So that's the question that I tried to answer. And so how do we protect ourselves against our own violence? More precisely, how do we violently protect ourselves against our own violence? Because the, the very interesting, I think, twist of Girard's thought is that we do not protect ourselves against violence by being non-violent. We violently protect ourselves. We use violence against itself, in a sense. We know that from, in a very common sense way in which we protect people who are attacked by resorting to violence. I mean, protecting ourselves against violence by violence is the most evident thing in the world. But the idea of Girard is that this becomes a can take the form of a kind of unconscious mechanism, a mechanism of which we are unaware. So, more precisely, how do we like to violently protect ourselves by going against our own violence? In fact, by telling the story this way, I kind of exaggerate a little bit, because René Girard, I call him René, <laughs> had a, um, uh, really had a, proposed a solution to this problem at the very beginning of his book, Violence and the Sacred. And the solution he proposed was the modern judicial system. And, but um, I was not satisfied for this, with this answer for two closely related reasons. First, I thought that the modern judicial system could not do that by itself. And of course, there's another reason why it's not satisfactory if you look at Girard's theory is because while Girard says that the mechanism which protects us against our violence is kind of like a spontaneous social mechanism which nobody controls. The law to the opposite offers itself as something which is rational and controlled by agents, right? This is rational, open discussion, and we, take this, we make this law. So in that sense, that was not entirely satisfactory within the structure of the theory. 
So the two reasons, the, the other two reasons why I thought the, the re, well, the other reason why I thought the judiciary system was unable to do that <coughs> is because the judicial system only works if there is a strong modern state to uphold it. In any society which has a failing state, as we call it commonly, the judicial system is plagued by corruption and other um, kind of privilege to we only take care of the groups who belong, the people who belong to our group or to our clan or to our ethnic. So these systems do not work, the judicial system does not succeed in working properly unless we have a strong modern state to uphold it. So therefore, my question became, what are the conditions of the rise of the modern state? What are the social conditions which allow a modern state to appear? But I did not ask the question in this way. Actually, that's the way what my problem became, but I didn't ask it in this way. Rather, what I asked was, what has replaced the sacred as the basis of the social organization in the modern world? And the answer to that is, I think, relatively evident. The answer is economics. It, uh, economics have become an economic reality, have become the transcendent reference of the political organization. States say we can't do this because we don't have the money. Or they say we need to do this because we need to compete economically with other people. The economics represent, in a sense, the transcendental reference of our political decision. They are viewed, economic constraints are viewed as was well limit the ability of the state. Just as previously it was religion, and just as Previously, religion was present in every aspect of the life. Today, what is present in every aspect of the life? From decision concerning education, hospital, everything, economics. It is economic, which is, in a sense, the fundamental structure of our social organization. That. So, economic constitutes the basis and the overall structure of modern life. Okay, so what is the central concept of economics? What aspects of the world make economics necessary? What problem does econo economy pretend to deal with? Well, my answer and was and still is scarcity. Take a quotation from Lionel Robbins, who is a very famous British uh, economist, which defined economics as the science which studies human behavior as a relationship between ends, and scarce me, which have alternative views. And economic rationality corresponds precisely to the optimal use of alternative means in a condition of scarcity. So scarcity is the fundamental issue of economic, and in a sense, it's fundamental concept. That's the point. So the ambivalence of scarcity well, is the name of the essay, and what do I mean by the ambivalence of scarcity? Scarcity plays a, funda a foundational role in economic as one, the main obstacle to the satisfaction of human ends and desires. It's because there's not enough stuff that we cannot all get what we want. And two, as the prime motive of economic growth. And it's because we cannot pick everything from the trees that we work. And the economy works, right? And thus, of the satisfaction of human ends and desires. First visage or face of the ambiguity or the ambivalence. Another one. Again, scarcity is viewed as both a source of order, because it is what pushes individuals to work and produce, and as a cause of disorder, because extreme poverty pushes people to violence or rebellion. This is part of our common political sense. Or again, poor neighborhoods are seen as violent and dangerous, while rich neighborhoods are seen as inhabited by people who work to satisfy their needs and those of their family. So scarcity plays two roles. It plays one role 
as the base, as the source of his order, and another role as a the motivation, and therefore as the source of the order which we create. The ambivalence of scarcity can be found at every level of social and political discourse, and it constitutes a source of basic moral norms. People are seen, poor people, are seen as guilty of their poverty because of laziness and, and forced scarcity is used as a means to make them productive, while rich people are viewed as meritorious, meritorious because of their effort to combat scarcity, which of course justifies their leisure. So, just as the sacred is ambiguous and constitutes a foundation of moral judgment, so is scarcity ambivalent and, sim and similarly a foundational of our, mor of our moral sense. There is, in our relationship to scarcity, a very spontaneous way in which we decide about what is good and what is bad, what should be done, what should not be done. Okay, so, <clears throat> in a way, first step, economics, seems to play the same role as the sacred in sacred society. But we haven't finished yet, because if economic plays the same role as the sacrificial institution did in ancient and more simple society, then we must, I must, we must, I must also show that scarcity or economics functions like a violent mechanism of protection against violence. That's what I need to show, if my, I can show my theory. How is this possible? Scarcity is usually defined as a set of goods and resources that is insufficient to satisfy the needs and desires of everyone. However, given that human needs and desires are considered to be infinite, or rather, perhaps, indefinite, that they are, the needs and desires are culturally and historically relative, it follows that no determinate set of goods or resources or quantities of goods or resources can satisfy the needs and desire of all. And this is, this is, you can read this, for example, in Galbraith's three, uh, Introduction to Economics for First Year Students, that scarcity ultimately does not correspond to any definite quantity because, as he says, higher production brings about higher needs and desires. And therefore, scarcity, so to speak, goes up with the production and remains the same. It follows that the set of goods and resources that is sufficient to satisfy the needs and desires of everyone cannot, by definition, correspond to any determinate quantity. It does not matter how much you have, from an economic point of view, there will never be enough. Scarcity does not correspond to any real quantity. It's a relationship. There will always be an insufferable difference between the quantity of goods and resources available, and the scope of human needs and desires. So historically, society have addressed this problem, this discrepancy between infinite goods and desires, and I mean finite, finite goods and desires, and, it, and goods and resources and infinite desires. I, I made a mistake there. That's why I'm trying to read it. I made a mistake again. In a way. Uh, in a way which was, which has been common to many society, and this way was to limit the desire to religious, political, and moral rules. Traditional societies all do that. There are sumptuary laws which prevent you to spend too much money, which prevent you to show your wealth, which prevent, which prevent agents from accumulating too much wealth. Or if they do, as in ancient Greece, they are considered as Parias as not the, the best people. The merchants are looked upon with a bad way. So there is a traditional way of taking care of this distance, and it is by moral rules or religious uh, rules and prescription. It is only the modern world that has given free reign to desires for unbounded material acquisition. And in doing so, it also became the richest society that ever existed. It did it by viewing, and it did it by viewing scarcity as the basic problem society need to resolve and transforming its scarcity into the basic 
of the social organization. Scarcity then is a social institution. And uh, historically relative and unique in human history. That's, this, is, this is the point I want to make. I want to make the point that scarcity as a social, is a social institution. It doesn't correspond to the fact that there's only one bottle of water here, but it corresponds to the fact that the one bottle of water here cannot be shared. So it is, um, it is a social institution that is historically relative and unique in human history. I say social institution rather than social construction because when people say that something is socially constructed, they often mean that it's not really real. And that it is just a socially produced and entertained representation. My claim to the opposite is that scarcity is real. Not a socially produced illusion, but that, that there is a fundamental difference between the natural limitation of resources, which in any case is an invent, invent, environmentally, socially, and culturally variable fact, and the institution of scarcity as the basic fact on which we build society and construe its relation to nature. So these are two different things. The fact that resources are limited, yes, of course, but the fact that we use this limitation as the basic structure for constructing our society and for understanding our relationship towards nature, that is something that is an institution, a social institution, not a given, so to speak, natural fact. So I try to show this, so this is the idea, I try to show this in two ways. First, by showing that in very poor societies, which have simple and fragile means of production, by fragile, I mean means of production which are such that if there's a bad year, well, there's no other resources, you know, the, the, if the harvest is bad, well, people are angry. Right? That's what fragile are. Fragile, it does not, it cannot adapt to changes in the environment, right? Simple and fragile means of, of showing that in, society, in very poor society, which have simple and fragile means of production, scarcity, as we, moderns, and economics, understand it, cannot appear. Why can it not appear? Because obligation of solidarity imposed to richer agents and households to sustain the needs of those which are part of poor. This is very, we find that in, in all traditional simple societies, nobody, in a sense, is in the danger of dying of hunger unless everybody is. Because whenever somebody suffers from a lack, then those who are richer have the obligation, and they sustain this obligation, of helping them. So these link of solidarity make it that scarcity as a set of good and resources which is insufficient to satisfy the needs of everyone cannot appear. What can appear is a set of good and resources that is insufficient to satisfy the needs of all, which is not the same thing as the needs of everyone. The central issue in scarcity is not the size of the set, but the to not the total sum of good available, but its distribution. And distribution is essentially a social question. Second way in which I try to prove this. I, the second way in which I try to show how historically scarcity was um, instituted is to try to give an example of how society was organized to, in a sense, produce scarcity. What I describe in the book, in The Ambivalence of Scarcity, is only one episode, and rather one that takes place late. The phenomena of enclosure that took place in England, in England towards the end of the 18th century. So, for those of you who are from urban studies, architecture, I mean, enclosure is a question of space. So what is enclosure? Enclosure is a system, I don't know, uh, which actually now has taken place, the equivalent of that. In traditional village in England, the land is divided into two major parts, actually. There is private property, landlord, so people own this property. And there is common property. And in the common property, everybody can use it. 
You can use it to send your animal. You can use it to collect wood. You can use it to make little plots where you can grow things. It depends. It will vary from village to village and so on. But, and you can even actually use it to build a house. Actually, the rule was that if you could build a house between sunset and sunrise, and at that sunrise there was smoke coming out of the chimney, nobody could move you out of there. So, what it means is that the commons were actually a way in which richer agents in the society provided, in a way, solidarity and help to the poorer members of the community because it allowed them to survive. So what is the enclosure? The enclosure was a system which starts actually in the 16th century, but then it stops. And then it starts again towards the end of the 18th and the beginning of that. Actually, by the end of the 18th, it's, it's over, so it's in the 18th century. A process by which landlords said, we would like to the common to be separated by all land, between all landlord owners, and it will be separated at the pro rata of what you own. So, which means that bigger landlord could account, <laughs> take larger parts of the common and smaller landlord smaller parts, and the poorer in the community, farm laborers who were not owner of anything, didn't get anything out. So at that point, it is very clear that land became scarce, that there wasn't enough for everybody. That even though there was enough before, there wasn't anything. And that is just the result, of course, of a social change. And that's what I call, in a sense, the institution of, of scarcity. Scarcity, the, the, the fact that suddenly the land was unable to allow all people in the village to survive was the result of social decisions. It was a social institution, but an institution, because it is true that the land is now insufficient to satisfy the, the, the the desire, not desire, but the needs of all, right? So that's the important point. <clears throat> so what interests me in this is uh, the enclosure meant that for the village to renounce to its obligation of solidarity towards its poorest member, and as a consequence, when land was therefore insufficient to satisfy the needs of all, and suddenly became in scarce. In the present day economic language, we would say that poor laborers became disenfranchised. And the institution of scarcity is inseparable from the process of disenfranchisement. But what interests me is how this disenfranchisement was simultaneously abandoning traditional obligation of solidarity and, and a transformation of physical space. The two things happen at the same time. You abandon your obligation of solidarity towards others, not by saying, I'm not going to help you anymore, just by changing the structure of the physical space. And it does the same thing, right? So, so far, so good, fine. <laughs> Scarcity is socially instituted, but can it also be a means of protection against violence? This is what I need to say now. Especially if it rests on the abandon of traditional obligations of solidarity, which were means of protection against violence. How can failure to fulfill these obligations protect us against violence? That's my problem. The answer, and this is the answer I propose, is that such obligation, because they proceed from the original mechanism of protection against violence, are themselves violence, and that they are ambivalent in their relation to violence. Both, they are both means of protection and against violence and a danger of contagion of violence. They can be a cause of conflict and violence as much as they constitute breaks that aim to stop these conflicts. The obligation to come to the help of those who are in need extends not only to food but also to protection and therefore includes an obligation of violence and most generally, an obligation of vengeance. So these means of protection, on the one hand, they protect the weakest members of the community, but on the other hand, they also make it that whenever a conflict touches one person in the community, it will tend to immediately touch more than one. 
So these very obligations, which are a mean of protection against violence, you know, if it is sure that if you kill me, I will be revenged, then it should make you think twice before killing me. But at the same time, if you kill me, then somebody else will certainly be killed. And then this cycle of violence will continue. So the two things, so the, these mechanisms, they have two faces. They have a face of protection and simultaneously a face of contagion. So therefore, that is why breaking them can actually provide a protection against violence because it gets rid of the face of contagion. Right? So in times of crisis, these very obligations tend to become the means or the road which violence follows to spread and progressively invade the whole community. There's a couple of reasons for this. First, because, and this is really important, because such obligations are not universal. And this, of course, is a big difference with the modern judicial system. They are not universal in the sense that though everyone is subject to the obligation, the duty the obligation imposes do not apply to everyone or even to all members of the community, but only to some subgroup, for example, one's family or clan, one's ethnic group, and so on. To put it in, a different, in different terms, these obligations are nominal instead of being anonymous. Modern law is universal and anonymous. You owe the same thing by the law to everybody. But these obligations are nominal. You owe something to this person because he's your cousin. But you don't know, owe the same thing to that person because he's not your cousin. They are nominal in that. That's what I call nominal as opposed to anonymous. It doesn't mean to mention the name, right? They are also generally nested in concentric circle. In other words, you have obligation to the those who are closer to you, obligation to those a little bit further, which are different, obligation again to those, and so on. So the obligations are like Russian dolls, right? They're nested one into the other. And they are uh, from the strongest obligation to the weakest. And as the anthropologist Evans Pritchard showed, in times of conflict within the community, these obligations are usually regulated by an ideal of equality. So that when conflict between members of the community and therefore members of subgroups become, une become unequal, others will join in an attempt to re-establish the balance between the opponents. So that if group a, a member of group A fights against a member of group B, and group B is, big, is bigger, then group C will come and help the member of group A to re-establish the balance. But of course, you realize that this is extremely dangerous because then everybody will become part as trying to keep the balance. Everybody will become part of the conflict. Of course, if you say, well, let A get rid of B, then ah, who cares, right? The violence exists, but it does not as much become contagious, right? So the consequence of this is that any conflict threatens to divide the community into opposed factions. Therefore, renouncing to one's obligation Abandoning others to their need and misfortune can play a role of protection against the violence. And that, I think, is exactly what scarcity does. It protects us by making us modern individuals, that is, so to say, people who don't have any particular link to any particular other individual, but have the same link to everybody, which is a very distant and not so important link. It relieves agents Scarcity relieves agents from having to take part in the conflict of others. It's your problem. I don't care. Why should I be interested in this? Right? Which then becomes their private affair. Their conflicts are private. But conflicts in traditional society are never private. They always include all members of the group. So scarcity violently protects us from violence because the same process which institutionalizes a set of good and resources that is insufficient to satisfy the needs of everyone, also transform us into people who only have obligations of solidarity towards very close friends and relatives, in other words, into modern individuals. People who have no obligation of violence apart from that which the state may sometime impose upon them. 
This new regime of, ob of obligation is also one where failing to fulfill one's obligation is not a transgression anymore. And that's also an important aspect of this. Modern obligation understood, are understood under the concept of norm. That is, they refer to what should be as opposed to what is. And therefore imply that what should be could not be. Unlike a natural law, a norm refers to a future that could be different. A con the concept implies that one can fail to fulfill one's obligation. For if one cannot so fail to satisfy it, it's not an obligation anymore. It is not what should be, but simply what is. Traditional obligations of solidarity, because, perhaps because they could not be fulfilled, have to be fulfilled. There's an obligation. Failure to fulfill them is punishable. And failure to punish such transgression is itself a punishable transgression. That's the main thing about I mean, that's also an important aspect of modern societies. We have tons of obligations which we are free not to fulfill. We can be blamed for it, but we cannot be punished. But in traditional society, that's very rare. Most obligations, you have to fulfill them. And if you don't fulfill them, you're punished for not fulfilling them. The replacement of traditional reciprocal nominal obligations of solidarity by universal anonymous obligations that we can fail to fulfill, though we should not, will have an important consequence on what can be called the ecology of violence. That is the form which violence takes in various environments. In modern society characterized by scarcity, violence will tend to be invisible. And the most frequent violence, the greater violence, the form of violence, will usually take the form of indifference towards the victim, rather than of direct hatred. Violence is against third parties rather than between opponents. Who are the poor in our society, but primarily those who are abandoned to their own fate by other members of the community who feel, and in a sense rightly, that they do not have any obligation towards them. Furthermore, these poor people are often collateral damage of conflicts which oppose others and in which they have no direct part. So I take an example. This is most evident to take an example that is pertinent in the context of this institution. In projects, for example, of rezoning or modernizing poor areas of town. My point is not that the claim to public hygiene, better sewer, etc. are necessarily false, but that the interest of those who are displaced in such projects tend to disappear in relation to the interest of those who lock in mimetic rivalry and conflict have to gain from the form of violence is, invis is invisible because, in a sense, nobody has committed it. Nobody has made the poor poor directly, right? It is anonymous, the violence is anonymous, but what transforms the bad luck that <coughs> somebody, of, for example, becoming unemployed, into a definite failure is not the event of losing one's job itself, so much as the fact that all feel that they have no obligation towards the unlucky other. In a way, in the modern world of scarcity, the poor tend to become our sacrificial victims. In a sense that they are viewed as deserving their poverty, being lazy or too stupid. Their demise is their own fault. Many, of course, may progress, protest that this is not what they think, personally, of course. But we should remember that this condemnation of the poor as guilty of their property, poverty is inscribed in the structure of our social security systems. Those who receive help from the state are suspected of a large number of failings and offenses. And in order to continue receiving help, they must regularly show that they are deserving, that they are looking for employment, that they are really sick, that they are not holding hiding some undeclared income, etc. In short, the poor are guilty, and if they do not repeatedly prove their innocence sufficiently well, well, it will just make them more poor. And this is viewed as a way of putting an end to poverty, but also this is viewed as morally justifiable, setting back to what I was saying at the beginning about the way scarcity structures our moral thinking. 
Scarcity satisfies the requirement of a self-regulating mechanism of violence for the simple reason that what protects us from the contagion of violence is not renouncing to violent opposition, but that conflict, instead of converging towards an, a unique victim, tend to diverge and to become isolated from each other. The result is not a peaceful community of persons who have renounced violence, but a society of strangers where each one is free to pursue his or her, her own private mimetic rivalry and is indifferent to what happens to others. Scarcity is, in a sense, uh, the flip side of the fascination with specific others. Indifference is not the opposite of passion and enthusiasm, but its opposite side, which is not the same thing. The more we become obsessed by success, the more we become uninterested in what is not directly related to our success. Scarcity... <coughs> so, the other point... Uh, or another point is the relationship of scarcity to Christian revelation then, you know, since that was the part. Well, I think that what Christian revelation does is that it introduces within it at least two ideals which are universal and which will tend to weaken progressively traditional obligations of solidarity. It's not just the idea that Christianity reveals the innocence of the victim because of course, as people have said, well, you know, if people are trying to, uh, if a mass of people are attacking a lonely victim, whom they think is a spy or anything, and you tell them, he's innocent, he's innocent, it's not going to work. They, re they really will not listen to you. But what Christianity does is something slightly different. It introduces, I think, two important ideals. One is charity, and the other one is forgiveness. Charity, because, of course, you see, charity doesn't have the structure of traditional obligation of, <coughs> of solidarity for evident reason. First, it's universal. It doesn't matter if it is your cousin, it doesn't matter if it is your enemy, it extends to everybody. Second, it, is, it has the structure of the modern obligation, which is that it is an obligation which you, tend, you can transgress. People are supposed to be charitable. Well, most people are not charitable most of the time. But that doesn't change the fact that they're supposed to be charitable, and that they sometimes are. So it is, it is an obligation which you can transgress without being punishable, without being excluded from the community. This is a very important aspect. The same applies to forgiveness. And because also forgiveness to be, is supposed to be universal, it's supposed to extend to everybody, and it is in particular supposed to, ex to extend to the people to whom it should not extend. In other words, to the people who have committed offenses against you, right? <laughs> Precisely. So it does, in a sense, weaken this obligation of solidarity, and I think that the reasons why people adopted these new forms of obligation which relieved them from the obligation of solidarity it was not only because they decided, oh, I will be charitable, or oh, I will forgive, but actually because it did serve a purpose to, uh, the, to their own advantage. Because obligation, traditional obligation of solidarity are radically expensive. To go and revenge your cousin means that you put yourself in danger, and perhaps even that you commit yourself to be killed soon. This is an expensive obligation. To be able to avoid it is a pleasant thing. And to have a form of justification which allows you to do that. So I think that it, this is the way in which progressively, it took a long time, Christianity brought about the weakening of these obligations, and this is well, and the consequence of this will be, after 1,600 years, pretty much the creation of, uh, of scarcity. So, the other aspect of scarcity, which is, and now I, I'm coming to the other part, political violence. The other aspect of scarcity, which is fundamental, I think, is that <coughs> just as In traditional societies, well, actually, the just okay. I forget the just as. That's not good. <laughs> um, traditional obligations of solidarity 
are what bring about, in a sense, the sacrificial crisis, because they bring about the contagion of the violence and the fact that it spreads to the whole community. And René's or, uh, idea of a spontaneous mechanism, which suddenly everybody focuses on the same victim, which resolves this conflict, means one thing. It means, or it, or it implies that nobody can win this conflict. Nobody can win. That is why the only we are saved, so to speak, for the community is saved by this spontaneous mechanism, which suddenly makes everybody focus against a unique victim. Now, what is the modern state? The modern state is some is some group, some individuals, which manage to capture the monopoly of legitimate violence. And in a sense, capturing the monopoly of legitimate violence is being able to win this conflict. And to win this conflict, what do you need to do? Well, you need precisely to weaken to the point of actually bringing about the disappearance, but weaken the traditional obligations of solidarity. And this is what Scarcity does. So in a sense, it allows the rise of the modern sense. Yeah. And if you look at it historically, when, um, it's not so far from the market. Which what would what would ha what did happen actually? So one thing which is important about the um, moral um, the uh, monopoly of legitimate violence it is that it is primarily or it is essentially a moral monopoly. The monopoly of legitimate violence is not simply to be the person who has the biggest gun. It is not simply to be the one who can exert the most violence, the strongest violence. To have the monopoly of legitimate violence is a moral monopoly. It is to be able to make the distinctions between good violence and bad violence, and to impose that distinction. And in our, state, in our societies, only the state at this point has this power to enforce that distinction. Distinction between good violence and bad violence, the distinction between what is the law and its power of coercion on the one hand, and on the other hand, what is the crime. This is a, this is a moral thing. This is not just a thing of force. It is a moral thing, and the question is, how does it work? How does the state gain it? Well, I think that we can find a, we, we can reread in a derided way, the social contract theories. Social contract theories are, whether it is Hobbes, whether you find it at Rousseau, you find it in Locke, in many, many people. They, except in Rawls, which is uh, angelical modern, uh, they all have the same structure, in a sense. They have the structure of the war of, all, of each against each, so you have a beginning situation of violence. And then you have a process by which the violence of all is transferred onto the sovereign. And this gives the sovereign the power to make the distinction between good and bad violence. This is the exact structure of the, the mechanism except that the sovereign is not killed, even though sometimes the question is asked, the sovereign is not killed, the, the sovereign rules. In traditional societies, what happens is that the victim is killed, and what rules is the sacred. But then people talk for it, you know, the sacred seems to have a hard time talking for itself. So what it means is that this moral monopoly which the state has, is the result of our transferring to the state our own violence. <laughs> That's what it is. This is what the state does. And this pacifies the community. It works well. But, and that was as the center of my book on political violence, the following paradox, so to speak, of the modern state. The modern state offers itself as 
having as a primary obligation to protect its citizen against violence, against the violence they may exert against each other, or the violence they may receive from outside enemies. That is basic political theory. But historically, if you look at it, genocide, administrative massacre, ethnic cleansing, most forms of massive violence have been committed by states against their own citizens. So a genocide is not just an accident in a sense, it is a very paradoxical accident because it is committed by the moral authority which is in charge of protecting. So that was at the heart of what I was trying to act for political violence, at my book for political violence. So my suggestion is that this is not simply due, is not perhaps simply a contingent accident. In other words, that, it is, that this possibility is inscribed, so to speak, in the structure of the modern state. And so, um, I, wanna add, I, I'll, I will not say everything, but I will just add one more, more, one more thing concerning this. Whenever that happens, what we see, actually, is that the state loses this monopoly of legitimate violence. And we don't usually perceive this because we think that we are dealing with what could be called political violence, as if political violence was something different from everyday violence. Now, there is <coughs> some rather interesting books that some historians have written concerning um, delation. Delation is when you go and say, hey, my neighbor is doing this to the police. Um, the, uh, the Gestapo, during the German, you know, they were nice guys. And um, people were encouraged by the state to delate, to do delation on their neighbors, to say, my neighbor is a Jew. My neighbor is listening to the British radio. My neighbor is doing this. Now, by the count of the Gestapo itself, which cannot be suspected of taking too much care of the rights and interests of citizens, because they were not exactly nice guys, more than 50% of delation were what the Gestapo called malicious. That is to say, people would say, my neighbor is listening to British radio, not because the neighbor was listening to British radio, but because they could get the apartment of the neighbor. Or they would say, my neighbor is a Jew, not because he was a Jew, but because, they could, because he was a competitor. He had another store which sold socks on that same street, or whatever, right? So 50%, more than 50%. And this ratio is just, we find it just about it. There is another interesting um, study which was done on the violence in the civil war in Greece. The civil war in Greece which took place just after the Second World War, and around or, until 47, I think. So the question was, why did massacre take place where they took place? So if you have two villages which are about the same size, they are as easily accessible. They are as far away from either the royal troops or before the, during the war the Germans or the communists. But one in five years received as five massacres and the other one zero. What is the distinction? What, is the, the, what, what makes that difference? The only variable that was found is whether or not they are interpersonal conflicts within the village. If there are no interpersonal conflict within the village, nothing happens. If there are interpersonal conflict in the village, what happens is agents use the violence of the state for their own private means. So when that happens, clearly the distinction between legitimate violence of the state and illegitimate violence of the individual has completely disappeared. Whenever these massacres take place, this is one thing which happens, which is that they, when the state loses its 
or not when the state loses, it, that's not the right way of putting it. It's not when the state loses its monopoly of legitimate violence, genocide and so on take place, but rather when genocides and this type of massive violence perpetrated by the state take place, the state loses its monopoly of political violence. In other words, the causation is in the other direction, is what I want to insist on. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll stop here. I've been talking for an hour, I'm getting thirsty. Thank you. You can ask questions. And um, questions in terms of, you know, this is not clear. Clarifications. Clarifications, right? You know. Anche in italiano, eh? Yeah, anche in italiano. Questo è importante. Olimpia Lodo, she's a researcher in the department of philosopher of law. Very good. Hello. No, I, I, can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you two questions. Um, I want to ask you the difference between a social construction notion and a citation. A citation. Uh, can you give me a definition of these uh, two uh, concepts? Mm -hmm. And uh, about the consideration about the private use of uh, Political violence in state, the last uh, subject we uh, yeah. talked about. But uh, I think that uh, you're right that, uh, um, that uh, uh, the use of uh, political, or political uh, state violence for private interest is very common in regimes, uh, in um, totalitarian regimes. But uh, it is possible also in democratic regimes. I mean, I no, 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 I, no, I, yeah, I agree with that. I, I think it is possible. But I think it is possible in democratic regimes. Also, I don't think that uh, <coughs> I don't think that genocides uh, um, and uh, administrative massacres and things like that only happen in totalitarian regimes. I think they can very well happen and have happened in democratic regimes, which of course will, will nor usually will tend to progressively use, lose some of their democratic aspect, but there's no, uh, uh, it's not, a, you know, it's, it's not kind of like on the one side the, the totalitarian regime, on the other side the democratic regime, no, I think. It, and there's a lot of other ways in which private interests monopolize the, uh, the state power, right? Uh, economically, for example, that, that's very frequent. But I was, I was fo focusing on the violence itself because what interests me is precisely how um, the moral monopoly kind of like is being destroyed by, by doing that. And, it, and, you know, the German case is interesting because the, the, the campaign of the Nazi was really to bring people to denounce those who were not good Germans. And the idea was to create a very strongly knit community. But the end result was exactly the opposite because they were all trying to get rid of the other guy. And instead of creating this knit community, what it did is that it destroyed it. And that is why the, uh, there was some internal memo to the guest apple to say, be very, very careful. Most of the denunciation are not good, are malicious, right? <laughs> and that's really interesting to see that, you know, they, they realized that it wasn't working the right way. Right? <laughs>
So to come back to the first question, the the the, um, the distinction between the construction and the institution, to some extent, uh, this is a question of vocabulary. In other words. Uh, a lot of people who talk about social, but that's, that's what I said earlier and I will repeat myself, a lot of people who talk about social construction tend to view social construction as something which takes place uniquely within the domain of representation. So I want to insist that it is not just something which takes place within the domain of, of representation, but it actually changes the environment, the world itself. And that's why I think the example of the enclosure is relatively clear. I mean, what happens is the physical aspect of the world is now transformed. It's not just how you look at it, it's the world itself that is transformed. So that's what that, so I use the word institution, maybe it's not the best word, but to try to insist on that difference. Okay, so it, it's, so yeah, in a sense, I don't think there is a kind of like, excuse me, vocabulary on this, this, this dictionary says this is institution, this is, uh, um, uh, 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 construction, and I don't know, I don't think there is a, a well-defined thing, but I, I, this is just what I want to insist on, I want to draw, it, so I want to use a different term to draw attention to the fact that we are dealing with a real transformation of the world to, uh, I mean, we could go in detail of this, uh, Hayek, who is a, not exactly left-wing, but nonetheless was a very smart man, uh, uh, makes a distinction between what he called descriptive and constitutive concepts. Constitutive concepts are part of what constructed the world. And in a sense, what has changed now is the constitutive concept. And because of that, the world itself changes. Okay? Yeah. Uh, I want to be, uh, I want to be, sh have to be sure that I understood well, that your idea is the idea that it's better to stay inside de uh, uh, say definite territory with definite people, with definite culture. So no, that's, that's not my idea at all. Okay. Okay, that's not my idea. This was a, this, what I said was not normative, what okay. I said was descriptive. Descriptive. Okay, okay. So it's not it's normative. Fine. So my, my point is not that we should do that. My point is that this is what has happened until very recently. Okay. And I agree that this is changing mm -hmm. until very recently. But the fact that it has happened, I mean, and I think it is true that it was a very comfortable word. But comfortable doesn't mean good. It just means comfortable, which is not the same thing, right? And uh, this, uh, and I, I'm just saying that this kind of, the, the, the loss, so to speak, of this world, it also explains our trouble and our difficulty in dealing with this new situation. And I, I do agree with you that, I mean, how much the law can without the um, support of the state exert a coercive power because it needs to do that. Right? It's an open question to which I don't know the answer. And it is relatively, to me, relatively clear that what we assist, maybe less in Europe, but I think partially, but a lot in North America, especially in the United States, is that the state is itself giving up its monopoly of legitimate rights. And that is a very strange thing. In other words, not somebody who's taking it away from it. It is giving it up. It is giving it up by doing, by, in a sense, what, as a title um, of a, nice title of a rather interesting book, which is called Outsourcing Sovereignty. <laughs> Outsourcing Sovereignty. Yeah, let other people do this. Let other people do what, not so long ago, were the prerogative of the state. And that is a problem, that is a real issue. That is a very real, real issue. Because it is true that we do not, I mean, the, just as I think that this state, which has a monopoly of religion and violence, is very closely related to the type of genocide and massacres and things like that. So I don't, I don't think that it's such a good thing, but I think being derogatory, that what is violent also protects us from our violence. In other words, that it always ha we're always in this domain of ambiguity uh, in terms of real effects, which is a different question from the question of the normative, right? But a question which we cannot avoid to face. That's what I think. Anyway,
any other remarks, comments, uh, questions? <laughs> Signs of exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can uh, we can close the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.